By 1966, Neil Young's days of struggling to find an audience for his music had come to an end. Buffalo Springfield, he was sure, would be the big break he'd been striving for. He'd formed Buffalo Springfield with a group of fellow musicians, one of which being Stephen Stills, whom he'd met a year previous. Stills was a talented guitarist and at this point was working as a session musician. Around this time, Stills had auditioned for a role in the Monkees and according to him, he turned down the role when they wanted to use his songs. Neil at this time was driving around in an old hearse but when the back end fell off, he just left it on the side of the road. Buffalo Springfield began playing at the now legendary Whiskey A Go Go Club. During this time, David Crosby of the Birds was a regular at the club but he won't enter the story for another two years. When Buffalo Springfield entered the studio to record their first album, Neil and Stills began to argue. They disagreed on whose songs would feature on the album. Both men knew royalties were paid to the songwriter. Stills ended up with seven of his songs on the album and Neil with five. Of Neil's five songs, he only sang lead on two. The album was released and failed to make any impact. Neil at this time was becoming frustrated with the group. He later stated, We didn't do anything as well as I thought we were going to. We never got any hits. Neil began to lose faith in Buffalo Springfield. 1967 was a year remembered as the height of the hippie movement. Peace and love were the last words you'd use to describe the group. Throughout the year, Neil would quit and rejoin over and over. They returned to the studio in January for their second album, Buffalo Springfield Again. Unlike their debut album, which was recorded in two months, it took almost a year. Neil was depressed the band weren't achieving the success they deserved, but when they got a chance to play on The Tonight Show, which would have exposed them to a wider audience, he left the group. Though in all fairness, that extra publicity was hardly likely to skyrocket their career. Stills later stated, it was sheer self-destruction. Neil later blamed their lack of success on their sound not being effectively captured. People loved the band's live performance, but Neil felt it never translated well to record. Stills and David Crosby had become friends throughout 1967. David Crosby was a talented songwriter, but very outspoken. He was currently a member of the Birds, but his attitude drove them insane. While Buffalo Springfield were recording their third and final album, Crosby was producing Joni Mitchell's album at the same time. He recalled his impressions of Neil years later, stating, Everyone was on eggshells around Neil. Say the wrong word, he's gone. Despite this, Crosby would later find it much easier working with Neil than with Stills. The group were all but broken up while recording Last Time Round. Critics held it a beautiful farewell album. The group's drummer Dewey Martin later attempted to carry on the group without Neil or Stills, but they sued him for using the name. With the disintegration of Buffalo Springfield, Neil began work on his first solo album. The album was simply titled Neil Young. He worried about his first album, the sequence of songs, the mix, and his first single, The Loner. The Loner tells the story of a domineering man who lives his life in solitude. The lyrics read, Know when you see him, nothing can free him. Step aside, open wide, it's The Loner. Legend has it the song was written about Stephen Stills. During the production, so many of the instruments were added later, Neil stated the album was overdubbed rather than played. Reviews were mixed, and so were Neil's views on it. He switched constantly between thinking it was the best thing he'd made before having doubts. In 
Nevertheless, Neil set out on an acoustic tour to promote the album. Audiences to these gigs were small and the reception was lukewarm. With his first solo album selling slowly and little interest in his acoustic live performances, Neil started thinking about playing in a group again. A group where he was the leader. Neil got together with three musicians from a band called The Rockets. Together they called themselves Neil Young and Crazy Horse, though the cover of their first album only featured Neil. It was a clever promotion for his later solo career. This album contained three of his most well-known songs. He wrote them while sick in bed. Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere was met with positive reviews. To date, it was the best work Neil had done. Neil was now living in Topanga Canyon while his former bandmate Stills lived 30 minutes away in Laurel Canyon. Stills had begun spending a lot of time with David Crosby. Crosby at this point was without a band. The birds had fired him during the making of the Notorious Bird Brothers. The two began playing with Graham Nash who at the time was a member of the Hollies. When they sang together they found they could harmonise perfectly. Nash later said their whole sound was created in 30 seconds. Nash left the Hollies and the newly formed trio began looking for a record deal. They first travelled to England in hopes of the Beatles' Apple Records signing them. The group performed their entire first record for George Harrison in London. He wasn't impressed and didn't sign them. Years later, Harrison would say he didn't like Neil Young's music either. Not long after, the three were signed to Atlantic Records. Atlantic had been upset by the split of Buffalo Springfield and set about rejuvenating Stills' career. David Crosby had been signed to Columbia Records, but they soon released him from his contract, thinking him to be unimportant and too difficult to deal with. The trio began work on their first album. Stills took leadership role during the recording. He played all the lead guitar parts, as well as acoustic on his own songs. At the time the cover photo was taken, they had yet to decide on a name for the group. They found an abandoned house in West Hollywood with an old sofa outside. A picture was snapped with the three sat staring into the camera. After this they decided on a name for the group, Crosby Stills Nash, CSN for short. The only problem they realised was the cover photo left to right showed Nash, Stills and Crosby. They decided to go back and reshoot the picture in order to not cause any confusion, but when they returned, the house had been demolished. Crosby, Stills, Nash was released in mid-1969. It elevated the group to stardom. The president of Atlantic Records began floating the idea of adding Neil to the band. He'd loved Buffalo Springfield and especially Neil Young. CSN had doubts about bringing Neil into the group. Of the trio, Nash put up the most opposition. He was happy with their current format and didn't want anything to change. When Neil first heard the CSN album, he was floored by the vocals. He told Still So when he next saw him. Neil was later contacted by Atlantic Records to join CSN. He agreed, but wanted his name added. A month or so later, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young headed to Woodstock. In August 1969, CSNY took the stage at 3am. It was the second night of the Woodstock Festival. When they'd arrived, the helicopter pad was several miles away from the stage and no lift was available. Neil found an empty pickup truck and along with Jimi Hendrix, drove it up to the stage. He later stated, it was one of the high points of my life. 
When they took the stage to perform, Neil was not in a good mood. The cameramen who were there to film the festival bothered him. He felt they were an interference for the band. He told a cameraman, One of you fucking guys comes near me and I'm going to fucking hit you with my guitar. When he later watched the film Woodstock, he found he'd been cut out of the whole performance. After performing at Woodstock, Stills and Nash were in New York and made an appearance on the Dick Cavett show. Stills displayed the mud on his jeans from Woodstock before Crosby steered the conversation to a political rant. Stills ended the appearance performing 4 and 20 before the two left. Soon after, the band had the option of an appearance on the Hollywood Palace TV show or a free performance at the Big Sur Folk Festival, which was raising money for the study of non-violence. The latter was chosen. A local artist felt the involvement of celebrities tarnished the event, so he heckled the groups as they entered the stage. Stephen Stills had entered the stage wearing an expensive fur coat he brought from the wealth CSN had accumulated. The drunk man shouted at him and then ranted on stage. Stills got into an altercation with him before coming to his senses and calming down. He took the mic stating, We think about that shit that that guy was saying, and we look at these fur coats and pretty guitars and fancy cars and say, Wow, what am I doing? So when someone comes up and freaks out like that, it strikes a nerve. CSNY appeared at the infamous Altamont Festival. During their set, Stills was stabbed in the leg by a stoned out Hell's Angel with a sharpened bicycle spoke. The group's first album, Deja Vu, began in July 1969. As expected, Neil and Stills both fought for leadership role. Neil strongly put forward the argument the songs should be as spontaneous as possible during recording, though the other members disagreed. An example of this came when recording Stills' vocals for Woodstock. Neil later stated, The track was magic. Then later on, Crosby, Stills and Nash were in the studio nitpicking. Stephen erased the vocal and put together one that wasn't nearly as good. Stills recalled the event stating, I replaced one and a half verses that were excruciatingly out of tune. For Neil's tracks Helpless and Country Girl, the tracks, as insisted, were virtually live recordings. Stills at this point had become annoyed with Neil's apparent reluctance to incorporate himself into the music. He later stated, Neil wanted to play folk music in a rock band. A studio engineer stated, he never even seemed a part of the group. Neil appears on only half of the tracks on the album. In contrast to the previous album, the mood was low during the sessions. During the recording of CSN, the band members were in relationships. For Deja Vu, Joni and Nash had split up, Stephen and Judy had split up, and Crosby's girlfriend had been killed in a car crash. Each member critiqued the other's contributions. Stills made Nash rearrange the song Teach Your Children, and wanted to scrap Crosby's Almost Cut My Hair. The vocals on Almost Cut My Hair had been recorded spontaneously as per Neil's instructions. Stills wanted them re-recorded, but they remained unchanged. In a later estimation, Stills said the album took 800 hours of studio time to record. In anticipation for the album, pre-orders generated a total of two million dollars. After the album was complete, the group went their separate ways. Crosby and Nash headed out to sea, Stills headed to England, and Neil went back on tour with Crazy Horse. Neil's contract with Atlantic Records allowed him to maintain a parallel career with Crazy Horse. On May 4th, 1970, students stood at Kent State University in protest of the US government in the Vietnam War. 
The National Guard arrived and fired tear gas into the crowd. In response, some of the protesters threw stones back to little effect. Several guardsmen began firing into the crowd, killing four unarmed students, wounding nine more. A picture of the incident appeared on the cover of Life magazine. When David Crosby bought a copy, he showed Neil Young the harrowing article. Neil contacted the other members and told them they must book studio time that night. Ohio was recorded with a B-side called The Cost of Freedom. Stills had originally written the song for the film Easy Rider. After the massive success of Ohio, CSNY went back on the road. Stills attempted to organise the band taking leadership role. Nash later stated he was a monster dominating force. After the tour, Neil began work on his second solo album, After the Gold Rush. Crazy Horse served as Neil's backing band for the recording. At this time, Neil purchased a 140-acre ranch. Neil paid the $340,000 in cash. He had spent pretty much everything he had to own it. In July 1970, CSNY were recorded playing live. The recording would be sold a year later as their next album, Four Way Street. The band were arguing constantly at this point. Their dressing room fights were legendary. The group split after the completion of the album. It would be four years until Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young would see each other again. In 1971, with the split of CSNY, Neil Young headed back into the studio to record his third solo album. He assembled a group of musicians to record a country rock album. The topics included loneliness, vulnerability and addiction. The Needle and the Damage Done was written about one of the members of Crazy Horse. Danny Witten had developed an addiction to heroin while working with Neil. Neil watched as Witten's talent was destroyed by his addiction. He was dismissed by Crazy Horse and later fired by Neil. The day Neil fired him, he died of a drug overdose. They'd been rehearsing, but Witten was in no state to work at that point. Neil stated, He couldn't remember anything. He was too out of it, too far gone. I had to tell him to go back to LA. Witten replied, I've got nowhere else to go. How am I going to tell my friends? Before leaving the studio. That night, Neil got a phone call informing him of Witten's death. Neil felt responsible and it took him years to stop blaming himself. The album produced Neil's first number one hit, Heart of Gold. Ongoing back problems prevented Neil from playing electric guitar, so he'd switched to acoustic. Of all the songs on Harvest, Neil stated the track Harvest was the best. Reviews were generally negative at the time the album was released. What Harvest did mean though, is Neil wouldn't have to worry about money. Neil was spending a lot of time on his newly bought home Broken Arrow Ranch. He'd purchased the property for 350000 back in 1970. That is the equivalent to 2.6 million in 2023. When Neil first brought the property, there was an old couple living on it. A caretaker named Louis Avila and his wife. Lewis took Neil around the ranch in an old blue jeep before asking, How does a young man like yourself have enough money to buy a place like this? Neil replied, Well, just lucky, Louis. Just really lucky. Lewis then stated, Well, that's the darndest thing I ever heard. Neil wrote the song Old Man About Louis. In an interview in 2022, Neil stated he was now 10 years older than Louis when he wrote Old Man. While at the ranch, Neil set up powerful speakers. Some played through his barn 
and some played through a big truck. The music could be heard from a great distance around the ranch. One day he invited Graham Nash over. Neil took him down to his lake, then onto a boat and rowed him out to the middle. Nash expected Neil just wanted a private conversation. At that point Neil raised his arms and the music came booming from two directions. They sat in the lake listening as Neil shouted, more barn. Neil at this point was working on his first film. Journey Through the Past had no story as such, but featured performances and backstage footage. Neil stated, I just made a feeling. It's hard to say what the movie means. Warner had agreed to finance it only on the condition it came with a soundtrack they could sell. When Warner saw the finished product, they were not impressed. They were, however, eager to release the soundtrack that came with it. The double album only featured one new song, along with music from television broadcasts with Buffalo Springfield, live performances with CSNY, and rehearsal outtakes from the Harvest Sessions. The record ends with a song from the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds album. During his next tour, Young began drinking heavily. He found the audiences were too loud during his acoustic sets and too quiet during his electric sets. At one point he screamed at the audience to wake up. During this time, Crosby's mother was dying and Nash's girlfriend had just been murdered by her brother. Warner had showed such little interest in Neil's film Journey Through the Past, he decided to find a new distributor. It was finally released in 1973. It had cost Neil $350,000 to make, and he used the same spontaneity in filmmaking he did in recording music. It didn't translate well. The film was received poorly by critics. Neil commented, It wasn't made for entertainment, I'll admit. I made it for myself. Neil's next album was recorded live on tour. Don't Be Denied was featured on the album and was his most autobiographical song to date. In the song, he battles equally against family, school bullies, or seemingly impossible dreams. Neil at this point was eager to play with a group again. With the death of Danny Witten, Crazy Horse had been reduced to a rhythm section. It seemed the right time for a CSNY reunion, and by coincidence, all four members were on vacation in Hawaii. The group got together and rehearsed on Crosby's boat. They put together a collection of songs and had a cover photo of the four sitting on a crate by the ocean. Once again, the group began arguing and the project was abandoned. Nash later stated, it turned into a piece of shit. Afterwards, Neil embarked on a ramshackle tour. He downed wine glasses of tequila in one gulp and mumbled for minutes on end between songs. During one set, he stated, we're going to play a song now, ladies and gentlemen, to try and cheer ourselves up. When he played in Boston one night, he had a problem with a buzzing sound coming from his microphone. He smashed it on the stage and stormed off before returning shortly after. Neil apologised and the set continued. When Neil brought his next album, Tonight's the Night, to his record company, they thought it was terrible. Even more so, they couldn't believe Neil would want to put out something so bad. Neil reacted without much emotion and simply started work on another album. At this time, another reunion of CSNY was in everyone's mind. All the members had released solo albums but none brought the impact of CSNY. They made a decision to reform. Nash stated that since all their problems had been in the studio, they'd go on tour first, then make an album. 
For the tour, they decided only to do venues with 30,000 or more. One of the stadiums held 200,000 and combined income from merchandising and ticket sales would come to over $10 million. Beforehand, Neil purchased a bus and customised it as a mobile home to tour in. It comprised of a bedroom, lounge and kitchen area. They were all set for the tour, though the band's substance abuse was beginning to show. Meanwhile, Neil's next solo album, On The Beach, was released. On The Beach was described as similar to John Lennon's Primal Scream album, in that he rejected his personal and musical past. Rolling Stone called it one of the most despairing albums of the decade. Years later, critics changed their mind and praised the album. After this, the tour Crosby later called the Doom Tour began. For the opening show in Seattle, the band played for almost four hours. Crosby destroyed his voice and was unable to sing the next day. One time, Bob Dylan came backstage and played stills the whole of Blood on the Tracks. High on cocaine, Stills told him the songs were no good. At this time, Stills got it into his head he'd run missions with the US Marines in Vietnam and began signing autographs, Stephen Stills, US Marine Corps. During the tour, Neil played songs from On The Beach to promote his album. As predicted, the tour did incredible numbers, but with constant disagreements, the group abandoned their third attempt at a CSNY album. A compilation album of CSNY was instead put out by their record company. At this time, Neil bought a house in LA's Luma Beach and temporarily moved away from his ranch. A lot of people who didn't know Neil were hanging around at the ranch, using his money to buy things, using his telephone, and Neil stated they were parasites, whether they intended to be or not. They lived off me. I didn't want to believe I was being taken advantage of. I didn't like having to be the boss. Neil was in two minds of what to do for his next album. He decided to put out his previously rejected album, Tonight the Night. He expected bad reviews and saw it almost as an experiment. Seen as Neil had previously recorded Tonight's The Night, his next album, Zuma, was released only four months later. Neil got back together with Crazy Horse and for the record recovered his Les Paul guitar that had been lost for years. The album included a track called Through My Sales. It had been taken from the aborted CSNY album and featured Stills and Crosby vocals. At this time, Crosby and Nash had joined forces. Songs from the aborted CSNY album began appearing on each of the group members' work. With Crosby and Nash collaborating, Neil and Stills got together and began working on a record. The idea was to pick up where they left off in Buffalo Springfield. For reasons only known to Neil, he decided to bring in Crosby and Nash. Neil visited Nash's house and played him a tape of the songs he and Stills had worked on. For the next few weeks, CSNY recorded songs for their second album in Miami. However, Nash and Crosby were on a deadline to finish their record whistling down the wire, so they flew back to California to finish it. They left leaving Neil and Stills with a half-finished album. Stills and Neil saw this as them abandoning the record and the group's fourth attempt at a CSNY album was scrapped. Graham Nash was enraged when he found out his and Crosby's vocals had been removed. He stated, Fuck them, I will not work with them again. The reason they fucking wiped out our vocals had nothing to do with the music. It had to do with whether they can have an album in time to support their tour. 
In another interview, Nash claimed both Stills and Neil's career are going downhill. Long May You Run was completed with Neil writing his contributions on the spot. They outshone Stills' contributions. The sequence of tracks went Neil's song, Stills' song, Neil's song, Stills' song and so on. The title track, Long May You Run, was a tribute to Neil's old hearse. The album was released and with that, the Stills' young tour began. The performances included electric and joint acoustic sets. As ever, the two clashed. It was again spontaneity versus calculation. Stills wanted the same set list each night so the songs could be perfected. Neil wanted to throw in new material as and when he felt like it. The tour deteriorated as it went along. Stills was particularly coming unhinged. Critics saw the tour as an opportunity to compare the two. Neil was praised and Stills was scolded. Neil later stated, Stephen started thinking that other people on the tour were against him. Stills began yelling at people while on stage and got into a fight after one performance. Neil later cited this as the reason he left the tour, but at the time, he claimed it was due to throat problems. Neil left Stills a message that read, Dear Stephen, funny how things that start spontaneously end up that way. Eat a peach, Neil. After this, Stills took steps to mend his relationship with Crosby and Nash. If there was to be no second CSNY album, there could still be a second CSN album.